Okay, another day in the kitchen. Today he's here. I've got stuff to do, I'm making breakfast, so you can answer, I wrote down some questions. Somebody want to know about termites, termites. and they're in, South, in North Carolina, and I looked it up, they have subterranean termites. They are okay. worried that if they get the wood chips, that the wood chips, the termites will live in there and grow in there, and what do you think? Because I looked it up and I don't think so. No, in my, my opinion, uh, and talk loud well, so make sure they can hear yeah, you. What I found in California, we've got western subterranean termites, and they hollow out the centers of wood. So the, the wood chips are in pieces, so they can't make a complete chamber inside a, a tiny piece of chipped wood. Um, I looked into Hugel culture, and that's burying logs under the ground and that wouldn't work for us because the termites would get into that unless you had really rotten wood and that's hard to find but as far as the wood chips if i was to put them down which i have i would keep them clear from houses or buildings and when they do travel outside of their caverns they build tunnels out of clay and you'll see clay tunnels if you see clay tunnel tunnels going up the foundation of your house or your building then that would be the subterranean termites and that's how they they move about they're creatures of the dark they don't like sunlight and they don't like to be exposed and that's well from what i read the wood chips aren't stable no, so they not... wouldn't be able to build their colonies in it because it's constantly breaking down so there's Everything I've read, they don't live yeah. in winter. If you break open a piece of an old log or something and you look inside and you find termites, there's a chamber, a definite chamber inside. And that's the same as the termites that I've seen in Australia and I've seen here. They hollow the wood out in the center. The core wood. They're looking for core wood. Um, there are other species of termites that eat grass and different things, but I think you would be okay if you've got sub if you've got subterranean termites. I think you would probably be okay. I would test it, test a small area and see if it attracts them. And probably don't put it up against the house. Yeah, keep it clear of your house because they do like moisture when they travel. And that's uh, it. Yeah. Go on. No, no, that's that's it. Their their biggest ones are I think they call them eastern. But it would be like, it's very similar to ours, Yeah, we have Western. I believe some of the Western subterranean termites have been transferred to the East Coast. Um, because years ago they used to put lumber and furniture on trains, ship it back East, and sometimes they would have termites in the wood products that they sent back East. Oh, this is what I have to make all day. This is just... Uh, in this, it's got two cups of sugar, white sugar, and what is it? Eight cups of water. So now my hummingbirds in the window are done for now. Okay, somebody else, a few people want to know uh, what zone we're in. I don't know anything about zones. I go by the Sunset Magazine zones, and we're in Sunset Zone 23. It's broken down a lot. In, in more detail than the USDA zones. The USDA zones, you know, certain places could have totally different weather, but they could be in the same zone. And it's not just the zone you're in, it's also your sub, um, what do you call it? Your sub, uh, it's not su my, your microclimate, because we don't get a frost here. Um, we've got good thermal drainage, which means that on a still night, the cold air will move down the hillside. So frost will form in still air, so we never really have any still air. Our neighbours just down the street, they get frost. So it depends on what direction you're facing. There's a lot of things that will affect the zone. That's right. How can they see a zone? Well, we're, where we're sitting, we rarely have any frost damage at all, and yet just down the block, 
they lost once all their avocado trees from frost. I mean, literally, we're just on the same block. So there's, you can't always go by zones then. Yeah, because we're south facing on a, on a hillside south facing, and we get sun all, all day long. Um, down there, the, the sun drops behind the hill, which is kind of where we are, earlier in the day. So they have darkness for longer. They also are cooler. It's cooler because they, they're in the a shadow. Sun, yeah, we have the sun longer, so, so we seem to stay a little bit warmer. Like you, That's true, that's true. So they get dark before us. Some of the areas around here in the winter, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, they're in darkness. And we're not. Yeah. Oh, just in case anybody's interested, this is what we eat. We eat eggs. We have curly kale, Swiss chard, dinosaur kale, basil. Oh, I think that's it. Oh, and broccoli leaves, which Kitty just ran off with. She loves her broccoli. You don't eat this stuff. You don't like it. I'm not even going to bother. So, and then we, I have to make everything in lots because... The dogs are expecting breakfast, and so I have to take the onions. I have to take the onions and put them in separate because dogs can't have onions. So I chop up the onions, and then they go in afterwards. So this way, they get the same thing we get without the onions. Oh, I keep cups like this all the time on my sink in case I want to collect seeds. Something I've uh, opened up and it's full of seeds. I have something right here quickly to throw the seeds in, and then when I get tired of them. It didn't cost me anything. I threw them away. <gasps> Talking? See, we can't do that. I threw the onions in. Okay. Multitasking isn't always that good. Okay. Onions cannot go in there. We know that. We know that. All right. Um, the hibiscus tea, I looked that up. Somebody asked me if they can do, like I do the mint tea, hibiscus. And the whole plant on hibiscus is edible. It's just taste. I don't know how good it would taste. See, that's the thing I, I don't know. Yeah, the, but I mean it can be done. Yeah, the main one that's grown in Australia for tea or for jelly or jam is ro Roselle. In Australia it's called Rosella. And that is a, a good one to grow. There's also our friend Craig has false Roselle. And that you can use for tea. Um, we, we don't have any of it, maybe one day. I, I actually think it's a cool plant to have. We just have the regular flowering hibiscus. What does it taste like? Who's guys? I, I mean, what's, I don't know. I've I never had it, so what does it taste like? I use Himalayan pink salt. I get that over at Sprouts Bulk. It doesn't cost that much. I'm doing my own thing. So, have you had hibiscus tea? Because I have not. No, I haven't. I just have the mint. I prefer the chocolate mint. You like the spearmint. Yeah. You drink it all. I drink it all. I'm... I don't like the orange mint. I don't know why. It smells like oranges. It, to me, does not taste like oranges. So, I mean, maybe that's what it is. It smells different. The chocolate smells good. So, you're drinking it and it smells like chocolate and with the mint. And then it tastes almost like that, too. Um, Spearmint I don't like. No, I like spearmint. Peppermint's good. I like spearmint because I believe that's what I grew up with. We made mint sauce, which was used on land. You know, roasts, Sunday roasts and things. Um, I didn't grow up with that. Yeah, that was, that was something that we always had. In Australia? In Australia, yeah. No, I never... My lamb was broiled and... Salted. <laughs> we didn't have a lot of lamb roast here. I didn't grow up that way. What else did, did people ask? Oh, they wanted to know why you're not selling your produce. Well, right now we're not produce. We're not overproducing. If it'd be nice to overproduce something and then take it to a farmers market and find someone that would be interested in buying it from us. I saved the lid so I can do the same thing. I can save stuff when I get tired of it and throw it away. <laughs> it's just the idea of sitting down and or being at a farmer's market all day and selling and dealing with customers when there's so many things to do here. He's not going to sit and all day and deal with people. He'd rather sit 
in his wood chips and see nobody except for him and his bugs and his dogs. Okay, now the dogs will have some and there is no onions in there. Now I can add in the onions. This way they get something. They don't need this. They've already had their breakfast, but they always have to feel that they've gotten something. Now I can add in the onions. This is what we eat every day, pretty much every day. Uh, let's see, coconut oil. My daughter's really big in coconut oil. She buys it like that lady does by the gallon. Um, you got to be careful with that. I've done a lot of research on that, and though coconut oil is good, it depends on how much you're using. You can overuse it, it's still an oil. I'm not saying it's bad or anything like that, but I would prefer the mint. First of all, the, the mint is like a green drink. And you're getting more of a vegetable, and it seems to be working from the inside out. Oil will make your skin oily, which could be good. And it has a lot of good things, but mint's got so many vitamins and everything. Well, I'm not saying coconut oil is bad. Like I said, my daughter buys about a gallon. She's using a lot. I use it. I put it in my coffee sometimes. I've used it for baking. You put it in your coffee sometimes. Yeah, occasionally I do. Yeah, but I still prefer. I think right now the mint tea is working. As long as that's working, that's good. Tilling. People are saying, oh, you shouldn't till, you shouldn't till. You know, you're tilling wood chips into the ground. You're pulling the nitrogen. You're ruining the soil. So you talk about tilling. Well, tilling, I'm trying to go away from tilling. I'd rather not till, and mostly I don't till. Um, to get the garden going in the beginning, I, I do dig and I till. But once I get things set up and I lay, lay the wood chips on top, I'll just scratch away an area and then plant in the ground and then move the wood chips back down. And that I learned from Paul Gauchy. Um, well, once, it, it, once you're set up, you don't tell anymore. You're done, like, like anymore. nature. Everything just falls and it just it creates layers and layers. Yeah, and you just I just keep topping up the wood chips. Once I once I get the garden beds done, they're done. And tilling is a lot of extra work. If you enjoy doing it, I don't see why why not. But you don't dig the wood chips in, into the soil. Um, the microbes require nitrogen to break down the wood chips. So by, and the microbes will get it from the atmosphere, um, because there's a lot of nitrogen in the atmosphere. So I wouldn't be concerned if you're just setting up the wood chips on top. If you dig it into the soil and there's nitrogen in the soil, yes, they'll take it from wherever they can get it. Now breakfast is done and we're pretty much done with this. Um, yeah, I mean, by nature, you wouldn't need it till. I, I still say if you want to set up wood chips, you would get it, a person who's just starting, I think should get it in the fall, lay it out, doesn't matter how thick, just lay it out, keep it watered, and then in the spring you, can, you move it away and you put in your, um, I would do plant starts in there because seeds are hard you know, like little plants. Yeah. And then once they start to grow, you put the wood chips back, but when they move it away, the soil underneath is fantastic. It has changed. It brings all the earthworms and everything in. I, I like getting loads in the early spring or in the spring because you get the remedial wood chips, which is, if I, hopefully, hopefully I'm pronouncing it correctly, the leafy part of the tree when they, it starts to really take off and grow because that's the highest nitrogen to calcium. Ah, let's see. You're looking for a balance between carbon and nitrogen. So the limbs and the trunks are higher in carbon and the leaves and the shoots are high in nitrogen. They've, they've got a higher nitrogen balance. So you, you want to try to I like the spring to get to get loads in. Well, you'll, you take them anytime. I'll fall. take them anytime. I don't care what they look like. I'm not fussy about it because I'll use the trees and the trunky woody sort of parts for walkways and driveways and parking areas and the leafy parts I select for the garden.
At that time, they called and asked if you wanted a truckload of wood. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> oh my gosh, when they said, do you think about one of those big trucks? And they were full of tree trunks yeah, and could... limbs. Did you split them all? We've been using them for firewood. And you're telling me we'll have it for a very long time. I got two, two truckloads of ash wood. And that is a really good wood for burning. It dries well, it splits easily. And I think ash trees grow everywhere. I'm pretty sure across the United States and Europe, there's different species of ash. But that's that's a really good wood for a fireplace. And I was very happy to get get the firewood. I just had to find a place to stack it. And you I will. To that. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not talking to the camera. Um, yeah, I just had to find a place to set it, and now that I've got it, it should last a few years. Yeah, that was, but the work to move it, I mean, some of these trunks were that big, and we set a lot up for tables and chairs out in the yard, which is nice. I've got a lot of things on it. Yeah, um, it was a shame the tree, I believe, was about three feet in diameter, so it was a massive tree that they had to somebody. take out, someone didn't want. I guess that's it. We could do this another time. I don't, I'll see how this works out. Just wanted to do a quick thing. I found this in the back of their freezer and I forgot about it. Um, last year I took some, we had lemons and I froze some and I tried one this morning. This was one of them that came out. I wanted to thaw it. And I was amazed how beautiful it was and how good it tastes. So if you've got a lemon tree and you're wondering how you're going to use up all your lemons, just throw it in a plastic bag and throw it in the freezer and I've got more lemons I'm going to start freezing and we've got a lot of lemons and here's my lemonade one. That's this one's lemonade. pink inside. Yes, pink. And you cut I believe them. it's pink lemonade. Is this one ripe already or no? Uh, I'm not sure on that one. You'd have to cut it open and say. I can cut it open. See, I know that some of them are really, really pink. Oh yeah, look! Yeah, I believe they're a cross between a mandarin and a lemon. Ah, oh, that's why they're kind of sweet. That's oh. why they're sweet. That's where they got the sweetness from. And then and the color. And they're beautiful. Okay, so that one was right. I'll have to get some more and get some frozen too. And they're easy to spot because, I mean, look at the difference. These are little, but look yeah, at that, We had that tree for a long time and it was just a tiny little two foot nothing until I put wood chips around it and now it's like five or six feet. Oh, it just took it, off. It wouldn't grow. I, I had given up on it. After I squeeze the lemons out and I do whatever I'm going to do with it, I don't know, sometimes I compost it, sometimes, sometimes I don't because it takes longer for citrus to compost down. Take the squeezed out lemon and wash your sink with it. What is about this? Wash the whole sink with it. Just scrub it all over the sink. I don't know how much is, is shown in here. It smells so good and it cleans. It cleans and I think it disinfects too. All right, I think that's it for today. We're gonna go eat. They wanna eat. And well, I'll try to go over. There's so many questions and answers and some people email me and ask. Uh, yeah, I've got more on there. We'll just do that next time. And we're gonna go eat. Yeah. Oh, and he, get on him people. Tell him to get his video together. He has made moving tools and equipment, like hand stuff, to move his wood chips, stuff how he sifts it, all his sifters. He's got a video, but it has to be perfect. Like, I need to be perfect. Look at me. I look like a slob. My hair is all frizzy from the humidity. And, and you and you were like, no, my video's got to be perfect. No. I don't think they care if it's perfect. They just want to see your stuff already. So... I've, Even in pieces. I've got a lot of footage in pieces. Talk to them. I, I've got a lot of footage in pieces, <laughs> but I've got to put it together and find time to put it together. But in the beginning, I was just using a shovel, and that's the wrong tool for wood chips. I, I was using a wheelbarrow, that's the wrong tool. There's a lot, a lot of things that I've learned in the past three years that I wish I knew three years ago. But you can, you can get a lot of information online, but sometimes you just can't find everything. So Yeah, but what works for one person may not work for another, and we know that from experience that, from all different true. things we do. You know, something might work really good for me and not work for you and, and somebody else out there, so they just have to try their own thing, what works for them. 
but still you give them ideas which you which you built maybe they didn't like but they'll say yeah oh I can do it this way and I'll just change it a little yeah and, and it's all about taking it's all about taking someone's idea and making it your own by tweaking it a little bit and finding out what works for you Paul Paul Gauchi, he likes a rake but he's on flat land we're on a hillside a rake's not as important as a manure shovel, for example. A pitchfork, I should say, not, not a shovel. A pitchfork is easy to pick up the wood chips. And the way I have to move them around, there's no way I can use anything mechanical. So it's all done by hand. Um, that's People have asked, why don't I get a bobcat or something like that? Well, we're on a hillside and We've got infrastructure already in. We've got buildings, houses, trees. If it was a blank slate, yes, I would say that would be great. But um, we've already got the infrastructure in, and I think most people do. If some people are lucky, they're starting from, with a blank slate on a flat piece of land, then they could use equipment. But here, the terrain just, you know, we won't be able to use equipment on our property. It's a nice thought, but it's not practical. You've taken some areas where you couldn't walk before and you've built it up, and I can now walk, and I've, I've built like places where I can grow squash and different things. So that, that Yeah, I've, good. I've put wood chip trails on slopes that are probably 30 to 45% grade and made them level, so you can walk around a lot the hillside now and I can push my cart around it. I've made roads and different things that I can use my hand cart on. Yeah, he made a bigger hand cart. He used to have a little red wheelbarrow. He used to move everything around. Now you've got a bigger one. Yeah, and it's lightweight and wood chips are light. You don't need anything heavy. It's, it's a quad. I, once I get my video together, you'll see what it is. A wheelbarrow is a trike. It's got three wheels and it can tip. This won't tip. I think we're good for today. We'll go eat. They're impatient. Are you impatient? You're looking at him now. Oh, is he going to give me something? <gasps> okay, I think that's it for today. I'm going to shut the camera off. We'll try this again another day. Move, guys. Have a great day, and don't forget to eat what you grow. Wave goodbye. Bye.